Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. Oh, hey guys, what's that? Just brewing another cup of coffee? That's exactly what I do. Now, this is what I want to let you know before we jump into the action here. I was on the Farsi Show with Mark Farzetta. We discussed the Philadelphia Phillies' ugly weekend, the Sixers and Doc Rivers. Do I have a hot take? Do I not have a hot take? Listen to find out yourself. And we touched on the Flyers just very briefly. So, yeah, I had a phenomenal time, and I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to listen to that here Real quick, if you're new to the channel, smash that subscribe button and like button. I would greatly appreciate it. And lastly, every Wednesday, I do a hump day giveaway where you have an opportunity to win an amazing prize. This week, it is a Devontae Smith Eagles jersey. You will not want to miss it. Head on over to my Twitter, at Broads81. The pinned tweet at the top of my profile explains the rules. Good luck and enjoy the interview. And joining us now on the Zados Investments guest line, we need a man for all seasons. We got not just a man for all seasons, we got Broads, Broads Media, Hunter Brody joining us right now. What's up there, Broads? You know, just hanging in there. This Phillies <laughs> team's going to be the death of me. Last night, I ate a gallon, not the full gallon, I ate it out of the gallon, though, the carton, chocolate chip cookie dough. Baggy hoodie, baggy sweatpants, sad movie after that Phillies loss. I guess it was two days ago at this point. And it was miserable, miserable. So I'm hanging in there. Wow. See, this is between you and me. I eat that, and like right away I balloon 30 pounds. You eat that, still looking felt, my friend. So there's a positive. Well, there's a reason why we're about chest high. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, it was, it was, now I got to be honest, I didn't watch. Saturday, and we're going to cover the Phillies, we're going to cover the Flyers, we're going to cover the Sixers as well, but I was watching that, I wasn't watching the game Saturday night live, I was watching it on my phone, like, getting the updates, and the reins of them, I had a family thing going on, so I had to go back and watch that horrid affair, um, but I'm following it, and I'm going, oh, good, oh, crap, oh, good, oh, crap, oh, go oh, my God, um, what, now, you ended the night eating a gallon of ice cream. That's good. I ended the night with a couple of glasses of Jack Daniels. So that's how I cope. Um, I don't know which one's healthier. But uh, going through the emotions of that game, everything was not just for that game, but everything was going great through the weekend. The Sixers were eking out wins. The Phillies were up in the ninth inning there. They were going to take two or three from the Braves after uh, sweeping the Brewers. Everything was right with the world. And then it all came crashing down. How are you holding up right now? I'm trying my best. I really am. You know, what crushed me the most in that game, everyone's been hard on Joe Girardi, and I've actually taken somewhat of a step back and said, you know, this team's 18 and 17 right now. Are they 18 and 17 with a different manager? The answer is yes, in my opinion. I think they're an 18 and 17 type of team. So I think this obsession with Joe Girardi's being horrible is somewhat overblown. I didn't love the double switches. He moved he moved Gene Segura out of the game in that horrible loss that they had in the extra innings. He also moved Alec Bohm to first base, put Scott Kingery in there, moved Brad Miller. The double switches have been head scratching. But here's what I know. My point is this. One, two count. Two outs with Hector Neris up with the two-run lead, and you blew it. So with the double switches that you question here and there, you had a chance to win a ball game with your closer up with two strikes and two outs, and he blew. He put a fastball down the middle of the plate with Pablo Sandoval up. I don't understand. Then you take a lead later in the game with Nick Maton's double, and then you blow that lead, and then you have a three-run lead going into the 12th inning, and you blow that lead. Like, this team had three chances to finish off that game, and they just couldn't. So this obsession, I know I took this to a different angle, but Joe Girardi's a hot item right now in this city, and, and I think that just describes how I feel personally. While there's some head-scratching moments, this Joe Girardi obsession that he's not good or he's pathetic or he's the reason why this team is what it is. No, they had three chances and they're an 18 and 17 for a reason because guys like Andrew McCutcheon early on stunk and things of that nature. So I know I took that in a weird angle, but that's, <laughs> that's my response. No, no, okay. So here's my response to your response. I feel like it's the Gabe Kapler crowd that are, that's a very loud minority saying, see, it wasn't Kapler's fault. Girardi's even worse than that. Look what the giants are doing this, that, and the other. That's more so what I think it is more than anything. I actually like Joe Girardi. Has he had bad moments? He certainly has had bad moments. But I don't attribute Joe Girardi to what this lineup can or can't do, what this bullpen can or can't do. I attribute it to the players not being able to produce. And here's really, uh, no pun intended, here was the uh, the icing on the cake here. Uh, when they spot you two runs in extra innings the way the Braves did and the Phillies still can't close out that game, 
I don't point to Joe Girardi and say that's his fault. And that's essentially what the Braves did Saturday night by having a horrendous overthrow to home plate. Nobody covering home plate. They score two runs in that inning, and then they still can't close it out in the bottom half of that inning. Yeah, and, and heading into that third game of the series on Sunday Night Baseball, I had two questions that I was asking myself and asking the team. And unfortunately, they failed both of them. It was, uh, and unfortunately for Aaron Nola, the team put him in this position, but can your number one guy stop the bleeding for you after such an emotional, for what is an emotional May loss? Can your number one guy shut the door? He was embarrassing. Leaving off-speed pitches to Dansby Swanson up in the middle of the plate. What are you doing here? And then missing location with fastballs to Freddie Freeman. Come on, Nola, you got to be better than that. Yeah. And then two, did Vince Velasquez allow Freddie Freeman to get hot? Well, the answer was, you know, the question was answered for you. Yes, welcome Freddie Freeman. Welcome Braves. You're back in action. Freddie Freeman got hot and Aaron Nola couldn't answer the bell. So the two questions that I had entering that Sunday night baseball game, it got answered and they were both bad answers for the Phils. Yeah, uh, so let me ask you this. What's it mean going forward? Is this just a bump in the road against a divisional opponent? or is this just a taste of things to come now that you're going to be taking on the Nationals, who have, by the way, had two uh, two losses in a row, back-to-back uh, -back losses, walk-off fashion, thanks to the Yankees. So the Nationals, you know, are going to be hungry for a divisional opponent. So it's weird because I enjoy – this 162 when it comes to the NBA it's like eh, the regular season is what it is get me to the playoffs right. for baseball it's like game 26 and I'm sweating and I'm just dripping in my basement ready for the next pitch I just enjoy the emotional roller coaster of all these series so when I think of it more big picture heading into this season I thought this squad was an 86 win team right so what they're showing us is that, is that, but when I see these awful losses and these upsetting moments, I take it to heart in that specific night. And in, you know, when I'm staring at the wall at 5 AM and then I turn on the extended highlights to see what went wrong. And then I'm up for another two hours and I look at the clock and it's 7 AM and I still haven't slept yet. That's just because that's what I do. I don't know why I feel that way, but I know that they're an 86 win team heading into the season. So this is that. So I, it's kind of like, I enjoy the emotional ride of the 162, knowing it's outrageous, but I also know where my expectations were heading into this. So when you ask me, like, what does this mean? I think we're just watching an 86-win team that's going to be about 500 all year long, and then they'll mix in that four-game win streak that takes them from 500 to just four or five games over 500, and that's what they are. So I'm trying to balance that. All right, so let's hope they at least balance it. Take two or three for the Nationals. We'll go with that. And as far as your sleeping issue goes, I feel like the ice cream has something to do with that. And then, obviously, the uh, the, the Phillies getting your blood pressure up. I think that might sure. have something to do with and, that. And, and the 10 o'clock cup of coffee. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I would I leave that one alone. I, you know what? Maybe do yourself a favor. Maybe uh, a little uh, the, the ice cream and the coffee, a little affogato, if you know what I'm saying. Pour a little espresso I over top of that. Let's party. I thought you were going to say decaf, and I was going to laugh in your face because I don't no. believe in that shit. No. Oh, what the? Can I what the? Ooh, whoa. What? Hey. Where's no, the dump button? Where's the dump button? <laughs> that's what I love about this. There is no dump button. Oh, just, wow. This has, this has our friend Riley Cote. That's it. I think, oh. he was the, I think he was the first to curse on this show, so we're good. He, he's the trendsetter. He's, he cleared the path. Well, I mean. Don't worry about know, that. I, I would love to follow his footsteps. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Don't I know it, um, Hunter? So here's what I, I'm I'm a, I'm on the same uh, same area as you. I had an 86 to 90 win team when it came to this Philly season. So I'm at least going to be rooting for taking two or three from the Nationals. Hopefully they can do that, and hopefully Bryce Harper can get hot again because that will be a sight for sore eyes to see Bryce Harper try to carry this lineup because we haven't seen it from him. We haven't so much seen it from Reese Hoskins. Alec Bohm had a great home run the other day. That was a big home run, huge home run. That's great. But I feel like you need a handful of guys to really get hot for you for this lineup to start carrying the team. You're not wrong. And I, I think the team put together nice wins against Milwaukee. I do feel part of that is they had 7,000 players on the IL. But yeah, you gotta right. take it, you gotta take advantage of that. But I don't think it's ironic that when Andrew McCutcheon actually sees the baseball and swings the ball, you know, swings the bat very yeah. well and produces, and Odubel Herrera gives you, I'm gonna say this very lightly, the best production you've gotten out of the center field position, which is not great. It's right. just better than anything else you've ever gotten to this point, that the team started to play better baseball. Now I look at a guy like Alec Bohm and I love everything he brings to the plate offensively from going the other way and two strikes. It doesn't matter. He just he finds a way to do it. But 
He's close to 200 right now, batting average wise. We need to see that climb. We need to see Bryce get hot. Reese was real hot, giving you doubles, giving you home runs. Now he's batting seventh, while Gene Segura is the hottest hitter on the team. You got to find a way to collectively somewhat uh, figure that out. But Gene Segura, geez, what the hell got into him? No, I love it. Happy to be back. Happy to be back. That's for sure. As, as soon as I say Andrew McCutcheon isn't an everyday player, he be, has the hottest stretch, hottest stretch he's had since uh, well, really joining the Phillies. A defensive, it's, I don't know what is going on. I just don't, no, I have bad. no idea how to describe, I don't know how to describe it. No, it, it's like he, it, it's not even like an age thing, I don't think. It's just a matter, like an, a guy of his age, what, 32, 33 years old, should have a feel for where the wall is on Saturday night. He didn't have that. And then uh, tonight, bobbled the ball again in left field, and he's done that, what, three, uh, two different times over the last two games, and you've seen it time and time again from him in left field throughout the season. Yeah, and when he was hitting 150, 160 in that range, you know, there was this part of the fan base that said, he's just finished, he's washed. And I kept saying, there's no way in hell. He's not 46, okay? There's something still in there. He doesn't have the resume that he has if he was going to go from 250, which 250 is a shell of himself compared to what he was in Pittsburgh. But if sure. he's a 250 guy, I'm satisfied with 250. He's not 150. He's not 160. He'll get back to that. And now he is. So I look at him defensively and I go, there's no way he's this bad defensively. So I'm waiting for that snap to happen on that side of the ball too because it's clearly happening at the offensive side of the dish. No, I, I agree with that. And the other thing is I'm not the type of guy that's like, ah, oh, batting average doesn't matter. But when it comes to a leadoff hitter, you do want to see that on-base percentage a lot higher than what it is right now. And if he can get that up, uh, that's where I'll be a lot more excited to watch Andrew McCutcheon take some ABs. And right now, he's making me excited to watch baseball, watching Andrew McCutcheon play, at least at the plate right now. Left field, not so much. All right, that's uh, that's the Phillies. Hopefully, they, like I said, take two or three for the Nationals coming up here. They have the off day, they reset, whatever, and hopefully that's what they do. Um, the Sixers now. Like I said, all was right with the world Saturday night. When the uh, when the Phillies were up on the Braves and it looked like they were gonna they were gonna win they're gonna take at least two or three in that series and all was right with the world when the uh, Sixers were up about fifteen or twenty points on the Pelicans then the Pelicans came storming back but at least the Sixers were able to nullify that surge and get the win against them and then follow that up with a win also excuse me Friday night against the Pelicans and then Saturday night uh, against the uh, the Pistons the Sixers right now I think are just hitting that groove where they just want to as you said get through the regular season in the NBA which is like all right let me know when the playoffs start. And that's where they'll really start hitting their stride. But right now, I feel like the the Sixers are in cruise control mode. How about you? Yeah, I agree. They're just playing, especially because every team that comes up on their schedule, no Zion, no Steven Adams, no Brandon Ingram. Then you play the Chicago Bulls. There's no Vucevic and there's no Zach Levine. Every team they play, they're missing so many guys. And it's the product. It's the NBA. It's the backstretch of the regular season. It kind of is what it is, but I don't I don't have a hot take with the Sixers, but I, I have something to throw out there that maybe it's not a hot take. I just I have a tiny, tiny concern, and it's actually Doc Rivers. And here's what I want to throw out ooh, there. Ooh, ooh. All right, here, my, All right. my, I love Doc. Obviously, he's a big part of them being a first seed, and I and I love his professionalism along with the entire coaching staff. But when I hear him say that he is going to throw an eleven man rotation out there. You, that's not a winning formula. It's not. And when I dial back to what happened last year with the L.A. Clippers, Paul George, and a very biased Paul George, may I add, mentioned that when they were up 3-1, it, the approach was, we'll be fine. There's four games left. We're up 3-1. We'll win one of them. We'll just do what we always do. We'll win one of these games. We're too talented not to. Mm. And when you hear him speak after the last game, he mentioned about the bench. I'm not going to overreact to one game. I've seen my bench. I know what my bench is. So is there something to the Doc Rivers stubbornness that means we're going to see an all-bench lineup in the playoff? If you're going 11 deep, and I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, he's too smart to know you can't go 11 deep. But if I base this off of his track record, is there something to be said maybe about that five to seven minutes of bench play with all bench that concerns you? Maybe I'm going out on a limb and, and going out too far in a reach, but something scares me about the five to seven bench minutes that we might see from this team. All right, all right. That is a piping hot take, all right? I know you started it off by saying that's not a hot take. Hey, the defensive end. It's a little hot take right there, my friend. All uh, I'm saying is I want to see – here's my eight. I want to see eight. All right, all right, starting, all right, starting five, starting five. George, George Hill. Gotcha. 
Dwight Howard until they play the Bucs in the Eastern Conference Finals. Then the stretching of it won't work and you'll use Ben Simmons. But that's for another conversation. And then number eight is Matisse Thibel. There's okay. my eight. That's okay. my eight. All right, that's your eight. So no Shake Milton. No, he's too inconsistent. No. Okay, all right. All right, see, now, th- now I'm glad you mentioned that because I think Doc Rivers, I think the direction he's going with the comments he made was a very simple thing. As a head coach, you want guys to think that they're going to be getting playoff minutes. So you want to keep them interested. You want to keep them drawn in until the playoffs hit, and you really got to start to make a decision. But if Shake does go in there because you need some offensive firepower and he's been hitting shots, whatever it might be, he's been hot, then I'm fine with that. But I think Doc Rivers is smart enough to know that you're going to have to go a lot of defense, especially if you do get that matchup with the Nets. Matisse Thibel will get that run. You're obviously going to be spelling Joel and beat a lot of minutes here and there, so it's going to come down to a lot of Dwight Howard, and you're going to need somebody to run that second unit anyway, and that's where George Hill comes into play. I'm not afraid. Here's, what, here's where I start to get concerned. I can understand going to nine. When you push to 10 or 11, if I do see that, if I start to see Tyrese Maxey, if I if I do start to see uh, Furkan Korkmaz, uh, no moss, no moss. Draw okay. the line there. But I think that's what Doc Rivers is doing right now by making that comment, making the guy because he's still got to get these guys to play what three, four more games left in the season. At the time that he said it, what five games left in the season. So I think it's more a matter of him managing the expectations of his roster as opposed to making promises. And I can agree with that. Nine, I'm cool with. I'm not over. And this is one thing I tell myself. If this is my biggest worry, the five to seven minutes of the bench, (laughs) the Sixers are in a great spot, my friend. So that's where I kind of look at it. But no, I I am worried about this bench thing because as much as I joke around about the five to seven minutes, those are, what if the other team goes on a 12 to two run if he goes all bench? Or what happens if, you know, whatever, the league goes from 20 or eight, geez, if they're up 20, that's amazing. But I love this hypothetical. Let's go, approach. If they're up 20 (laughs) and the league gets cut to 12 and you got to call a timeout, you know, who knows? But uh, I can, I can live with shake as a nine. All I'm saying is there is something with this bench rotation that I think doc is tied to that I'm a little afraid of. But when you have a superstar like Joel Embiid, they overcome a lot of flaws. I go through this all the time. No NBA championship team is perfect. LeBron overcomes that. Steph Curry overcomes that. Your superstars overcome your flaws. And one of those flaws might have to be the inability of Ben Simmons to shoot a basketball. But I digress. <laughs> uh, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm still in the school of Ben needs to shoot that outside shot. I'm not the end-all be-all with it. Uh, but I will say that it does need need to happen at some point. Uh, but here's – I want to make a bet with you, my friend. I want to make Ooh. a bet with you. I'll, I'll, I will bet you, and you don't, you, you don't have to match me, nothing. I'm just saying I will tell you right now if uh, – if you have a game in the playoffs where the Sixers aren't in the midst of a blowout, aren't, it can't be a blowout, it can't be a 20-point game. So I'll make the line there. If the Sixers have a game where they have nine different players play at least 19 minutes, I will give you 50 bucks. Boom. Okay. 50 wow. bucks. Oh, All right. oh, and I'll buy you a gallon of that uh, the, the the ice cream, the Ooh. chocolate chip cookie dough or whatever it is. How about that? Oh, that's okay. how confident I am. That's how, oh. that's how, that's how confident I am. Well, that's guess what? I hope I lose this bet. <laughs> how about that? I hope you're, I lose this bet. You're now the biggest Doc Rivers fan out there. No, I know no, you're a I, fan of yeah. I am. I don't I don't want to just to be clear, I love Doc. I love where we are. There, there that is my tiny concern. But as I said, if that's my biggest concern, is a tiny concern. Well, then yeah. guess what? We're in a great spot. We are in a great spot. We're in a great spot. We are, we are in a great spot. Now, hey, you know what's not a great spot? The Flyers. How's that for a transition? Uh, so they wrap up the season tonight against the Devils. Uh, 7 o'clock uh, puck drop, South Philadelphia, blah, blah, blah. Horrible season, blah, blah, blah. What will the Flyers have to do next year? Or what What do they need to do? Put, put it this way. What do they need to do this offseason to convince you that they got something special waiting for you next year? Well, I don't know if they're going to have something special unless it's the track record of miss playoffs, make playoffs, miss. At this point, they're going to be making the playoffs. Here's what I think they need to do. And I remember I was on your show super early of the flyer season. And you asked me how far can this team, this is when we were an optimistic, they were winning all these games, but it was, it was like an ugly watch and the D zone was abysmal. And I said, if this D zone continues, I don't even think they're going to win one round. And you were like, what, what? And I'm like, I'm telling you. Fires, I'm telling you, and look at us today. Here's what they need to do in the offseason. They got to unload Voracek, and how they're going to do that is they're going to call Seattle and say, I'm going to give you whatever the draft pick is, whatever the – I was talking to Jason Martinez about this. I'm like, yeah, what's it going to take to maybe get rid of the Voracek contract? And he said, maybe a mid-level prospect, which kind of seems small. Like, I was like, wow, okay, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Yeah, right, so done. If, if, 
if we're basing that off of someone who's very, you know, intact with the team and the organization, if that's something that makes sense to him, I'll take that for what it is. And uh, that's where I think it has to start. I think they got to maybe move on from Voracek, call Seattle in the expansion draft. You're going to have to take on some sort of money to Seattle, that is, because, mm -hmm. they, you know, they got to make the salary cap work and whatnot. Voracek, here's a prospect, take him from us. And that is the start of the changing of the core that unfortunately needs to start happening. Uh, Cam York got his first 20 minutes the other night. Uh, how'd he look to you? Great. You know, absolutely great. The problem is, and I, I dive a little bit heavier than most, there's a kid by the name of Cole Caulfield who plays for the Montreal Canadiens, and I wanted him so bad, and the Flyers skipped out on him, picked Cam York instead, and Cole Caulfield has two overtime game winners in his first two games or so. So it's like, all right, here's this kid just tearing it up, but to be fair, I think both players are going to be studs. Uh, Cam York looks solid. He's a good defenseman who's going to log in 20-plus minutes for you once he gets there. As we see with Ivan Provov, he's been in the league for X amount of years, and he still has time to grow to groom into that number one defenseman that we want. So it's a work in progress for a young defenseman like Cam York, but he shows the skills of you know a player that is legit in this league, no doubt. Well, last thing for you, Hunter Brody, of course, Sports Talk with Broads. How concerned are you about the great Carter Hart going forward? I'm not. I think all of it was. Uh, don't get me wrong. He made mistakes. He got beat short side and whatnot. But if you clean up that, it's it's the Eagles thing. The offensive line was horrendous, and the the wide receivers couldn't get separation, and the head coach's game plan was a little wonky with the play designs, and then Carson went stunk. I think if you fix the offensive line, if you fix the wide receiver problem, and you got a different head coach in there, I think we would have saw a different Carson Wentz. There's another hot take for you. So it's the same thing with Carter Hart. All right. If you fix the product in front of Carter Hart, I think you got a different Carter Hart. We saw that in the year prior. So that's mm. my assessment on Carter. I think, uh, the, look, there's a reason why we talk about Carter the way we do in the beginning. He's a 20-year-old goaltender. You just don't see this. You're right. You don't see this. And that's why he goes through the ups and downs that we saw. Easy enough. Hunter Brody, Sports Talk with Broads. Always a pleasure. Broads Media, thanks for uh, bringing the uh, – I think the first one was a mild take, and then the last was a hot one. So that you brought all, you brought a lot of takes, my friend. I always appreciate that. Well, that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's why I'm. I'm <laughs> yeah, that's what I do around here. All right, try, just lay off the ice cream. It'll catch up with you sooner or later. Take it from someone who knows. All right, brother. Well, actually, uh, it's almost it's time for a coffee. <laughs> Hunter Brody checking in on the show. Always good seeing you, buddy. Thanks so much. Absolutely, thank you, Hunter Brody, joining us on the Zato's Investments guest line.